Good evening. Um, I'm Karen Engel, a professor here at the University of Texas School of Law and also co-director of the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice. And on behalf of the Rappaport Center and the Rothko Chapel, it's my great honor to welcome you this evening to the third annual Francis Charlton Sissy Farenthal Endowed Lecture in Peace, Social Justice, and Human Rights. <laughs> The lecture will be delivered by Ajahn Pu, whom you'll hear more about shortly. It's exciting to share the stage not only with her this evening, but with Sissy Farenthal and with Raj Patel, whom you'll both have the, you'll have the privilege of hearing from tonight as well. This event is the result of a collaboration between the Rappaport Center here at UT and the Rothko Chapel in Houston. We've partnered to present the lectures um, in alternating years. And I'd like to take a moment to recognize two representatives here from the Rothko Chapel, um, David Leslie, who's the executive director, and you'll hear from him at the end of the program, and Ashley Clemmer, who is right there, um, and is the program and community engagement director. Um, and I should also say, and Sissy is the honorary director of the Rappaport of the Rothko Chapel as well, and on the Rappaport Center Advisory Board, so she's doing double duty. Um, and while I'm at it, let me also recognize um, my co-director, Dan Brinks, um, who is here on the front row. He's a professor in government. Um, and our assistant director, uh, William Billy Chandler, um, back here, and or up here. And it's an understatement to say that Billy has been instrumental in ensuring that every part of this evening runs smoothly. So, thank you, Billy. <laughs> well, you're already starting off well with your plug. Um, so, the lecture series was made possible when three years ago, a number of Sissy's friends from all over the country came together to help the Rappaport Center establish an endowed lecture in Sissy's name. Together, they've pledged and donated over $100,000 of our $200,000 goal. And I have to say that fundraising for this lecture is the easiest fundraising I've ever done. Um, and it's been easy, actually. And not only because of the respect and love that people have for Sissy, but because they're eager to continue to find ways to engage with her and her ideas. We need her relentless pursuit of social justice more today than ever. Now here's our criteria for the lectureship, and it's in your program, I think. So in line with Sissy's own history of exposing and responding to injustices and inequality, as both a public servant and citizen, the lecture series will bring internationally renowned scholars, activists, and politicians who will inspire their audiences to think and act creatively to respond to some of the greatest challenges of the 21st century. It's a demanding call, but Ai Jin Pu is up to the task of inspiring, and I can tell that we have an audience of people ready to be inspired, and indeed who are already thinking and acting creatively to address challenges, and quite frankly, challenges that we could never have anticipated when we set the lectureship up. One of the reasons we selected Ai Jen Pu for the lecture tonight, and that I suspect she chose us, is because she shares Sissy's commitment to and passion for a more just world for poor women, especially women of color, who have long performed some of the most important work in this country for some of the lowest wages and with the least ability to control their working conditions. Sissy's time directing the legal aid office in Nueces County, <coughs> Texas, her four years representing Nueces County in the Texas legislature, her work as the first chair of the National Women's Political Caucus, and her grassroots and organizing work at both the domestic and international level since then, including countless demonstrations, all show that commitment. And were she not here, I would go on to explain in some detail. 
But since we have the fortune of having her with us today, I'm going to let her do that in just a moment. Now, after Sissy speaks, my colleague from the LBJ School of Public Affairs, Raj Patel, award-winning writer, activist, and academic, um, will introduce Aijen. And though they've never personally met, I think, their work has definitely been in conversation. And Raj's most recent book, for example, is titled The History of the World and Seven Chief Things, A Guide to Capitalism, Nature, and the Future of the Planet. Um, and a chapter of that book is devoted to care as one of the seven chief things that facilitates capitalism. Now, before I turn the podium over to Sissy, um, let me just point out that in your program, you have an index card, right, um, already in the program. And if you need a pen, um, some pens will be floating around, so you can just lift a finger and one should come your way. Um, we'd like to ask that if you have a question for iGen during her lecture, um, that you write it on the card any time during the lecture and pass it to the aisle um, on the outside aisle. And um, folks, uh, terrific students who work with us at the Rappaport Center are the ones who will be standing and walking around, um, and that's in order to pick up the cards um, and deliver them to us uh, so that we can call them and um, try to get as many of the questions asked at the end. Um, so uh, Raj and I will um, pull them together and come back up after the conversation. Um, and we won't get to all of them because there will be many more than there would be if you, we had people stand up at microphones. But the great thing is that iGen will have those questions um, and very much wanted to be able to engage with them <coughs> afterward. So with no further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Sissy Ferenthold to the podium. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. It really is wonderful that you've come, and thank you, each of you. A couple of weeks after I was elected to the legislature, I had a phone call from a former classmate of mine, a wonderful federal district judge named Woodrow Seals. And he asked me for lunch. And a few days after that, I went to lunch with him. He asked me not to forget the women and the, their children when I went to the legislature. And I told him from my two years at, at uh, Legal Aid, I had seen the plight of unskilled women and their children, and they were the scapegoats of our society. So I'd like to say something has changed. The domestic workers are being organized. And I want to salute those that came here that are working on that issue. It's long overdue. There are other wonderful things that our speaker will be sort of telling us about. And so I'll leave the rest of the time to her and the other speakers. Thank you again. Thank you, uh, Sissy, and <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, thank you, uh, Dan and Karen and Billy. Um, thank you, members of the jury. Uh, <laughs> this is a very strange room, but it's, it, 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 but it is, uh, I, I think, wonderful uh, and, and appropriate in, in, a, in, a, in an important way. That what we're putting on trial here is uh, why it is that care is so undervalued. Um, the modern economy wouldn't be possible without care. The United Nations in 1995 uh, tried to put a value on how much of the world economy was dependent on unpaid work. And the number they came up with was about 50%. 50% of the world's economy is, uh, rests uh, on a foundation of unpaid work. We wouldn't be able to have the trillions on Wall Street without the unpaid work uh, uh, happening around the world, predominantly done by women. Uh, and that is something that, is, uh, th that we see even in the, the International Labour Organization's uh, recent uh, uh, notices that we live in a world where there are 40 million people in forced labour, in modern day slavery. The majority of them involved in domestic, uh, uh, the majority of them women, 
uh, and the largest proportion of them involved in domestic work. So what sort of person fights back against that? Um, well, fighting against this racial, racially and gendered oppression has been iGen's work. And you'll know already that she is the winner of a MacArthur Genius Award. You know that she founded Domestic Workers United in the year 2000. But what about iGen before that? Um, to, to find out a little bit, I, I spoke to, uh, uh, did, you know, to give you a sense of things you couldn't find out from Wikipedia. Um, I spoke to Eric Tang. Um, who, uh, before his professorship in black studies here, uh, was a community organizer in the same circles uh, as iGen in New York. And uh, before Domestic Workers United in the 1990s, um, he remembers iGen building the base for the movements we have today, where her shop floor were the parks of New York, um, where those who cared for the children of the rich also cared for one another. Uh, and when the weather turned, um, the shop floor was the, the aisles of the children's section at Barnes and Noble, um, where, again, uh, w workers uh, g uh, were, were organizing and, were, and got together and were pushed uh, by the management at Barnes and Noble, who no doubt had been informed that there was seditious union activity happening there. Um, but uh, iGen stood her ground. Um, and uh, Eric remembers uh, that, uh, I mean, you know, this, this work is hard and it can be dangerous, but it can also be rewarding. Um, like the time that Igen uh, asked him to accompany her uh, to serve papers to a millionaire banker in his Manhattan home. And I quote Eric here, hands down, one of the best assignments I was ever given as an organizer. <laughs> um, and that's important because Igen's work recognizes and embraces these moments of joy. As she says in her incredible book, Age of Dignity, getting older isn't a crisis, it's a blessing. To think of care and of activism as drudgery is to miss its power to transform and to make us better. iGens is a deep and compassionate activism, an activism that insists that care really is going to save us all. And so to learn more, I'd like to hand over the stage to iGen Pu, as she honors us by being the Francis Tarleton Sissy Farenthold Endowed Lecture, lecture Series in Peace, Social Justice, and Human Rights, and she addresses us on immigration and the future of American families. Thanks very much, Adrian. I'm never speaking anywhere again without you. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, good evening, and thank you so much for coming out tonight. It's really wonderful to see all of you. I'm so honored um, to be here and to be um, actually in the presence of Sissy Farenthold, who is a heroine, a national treasure. Um, and it's particularly important for me to be in her light and in her presence because for, her, for me, she embodies the kind of moral courage that we really need in this moment in our country. Um, so thank you, Sissy, wherever you disappeared to. Oh, there you are. <laughs> for your incredible courage and for standing with um, the most vulnerable and least visible among us when we needed it the most. Um, and I want to also thank Karen Engel and Billy Chandler for all the hard work to get me here. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and to bring together some of my affiliates and partners in the state of Texas. And I want to especially recognize the members of the Texas Domestic Workers Coalition from Ayuda, from Fuerza de Valle, and Domesticas Unidas. <laughs> Shout out to these wonderful organizers. They're organizing in El Paso and San Antonio and the Rio Grande Valley along the border against all odds to bring dignity to this work that makes all of their work possible. Um, I also want to say, just as long as we're in the gratitude department, um, that uh, we're so grateful for those of you who've been involved in the hurricane relief work. Um, we know this region has endured a tremendous amount of devastation and that the relief and rebuilding is ongoing. Um, and I just want to lift up the work that Living Hope is doing um, in the city of Houston to provide relief to vulnerable communities. And thank you for being here as well. Um, 
and so the last gratitude piece is I'm going to actually ask you all to engage in a gratitude exercise with me. Um, this conversation tonight is about care um, and whether it truly can save us all. And so I'm actually going to ask you to turn to the person sitting next to you and spend just two minutes sharing a story about someone in your life who's cared for you and the value of that relationship in your life. So two minutes. Okay, I'm going to ask us to come back together. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, I always find it helpful to ground it in um, our personal connection to this issue because it is actually one of the very few issues that every single person um, can really connect to. And it's important to really ground in those in this moment. Um, so, one of my favorite speeches of all time was the uh, commencement address that George Saunders gave at Syracuse University in 2013. And in speaking to the young graduates, Saunders wanted to help the young graduates understand, anticipate their futures. And he said, the things in life that we regret the most are not the things that you might expect, but rather failures of kindness, those moments when another human being was there in front of us, suffering, and we responded sensibly, mildly, reservedly. Or to look at it from the other end of the telescope, who in your life do you remember most fondly with the most undeniable feelings of warmth, those who are kindest to you? Saunders goes on to admit that kindness is, in fact, not easy, but he believes that it becomes more natural with age. He quotes the poet Hayden Carruth, who wrote near the end of his life that he was mostly love now. Saunders wished for his graduates to embrace this awareness early, avoiding failures of kindness, and instead strive to be ever more kind and connected to others, and ultimately, mostly love. Now, I don't know if they became this way as they grew older or if they were always this way, but my grandparents were certainly mostly love by the time I entered the world. Um, 
they showered my sister and me with kindness. Um, they played a huge role in raising us, cared for us, laughed with us, offered really important perspective on life. From my grandmother, I learned how to appreciate and cultivate laughter. She's one of those people that believes that if you laugh from the bottom of your belly three times a day, you'll live a really healthy life and then just die one day. Um, <laughs> And she also taught me how to use the potty, which proved to be useful. Um, and she also taught me how to cook, but we both agree that that's still very much a work in progress. Um, from my grandfather, I learned hard work and discipline. I learned Tai Chi. He was a lifelong practitioner, and after retirement, he became an instructor. And I remember growing up watching him practice Tai Chi early in the mornings from my bedroom window those slow and steady, deliberate motions. And it was with him that I also developed a deep appreciation for the hidden strategies of the TV show Wheel of Fortune. Um, I feel incredibly fortunate to have had that time with them and to have been cared for by both of them, two extraordinary people. Um, on different sides of my family, but with very similar life experiences early in life defined by poverty in China, war, migration, hard work, each a full life of hardship and triumph. And then later their stories begin to diverge. My paternal grandfather lived to the age of 93, a long and for the most part really healthy life. Um, however, the final months will haunt me forever. After my grandfather's vision and other functions started to deteriorate, my father could no longer care for him at home and had to place him in a nearby nursing home against his wishes. I visited him there and even now my memory of the visit um, is, gives me the chills. My grandfather's bed was in a dark room that he shared with about half a dozen other people, some of them completely still and unmoving, others wailing in pain and suffering. It smelled of mold and illness. It was like a fluorescent light that would flicker. It didn't work properly. Um, and it was clear that my grandfather hadn't slept or eaten for days. And while he was alive enough to tell me he was afraid, I knew that he was dying inside. He passed away after just three months in that frightening facility. My grandmother, on the other hand, um, my maternal grandmother is still with us. She's 93. Uh, she lives in her own apartment in Southern California across the street from a Chinese grocery, um, not far from a Chinese hair salon where they know how to perm her hair exactly the way she likes it. Um, she goes to church twice a week and stays very active. She and I play mahjong together and she lets me win once a year. Um, <laughs> She's living life on her own terms, or in Atul Gawande's words, um, she's the author of her own story, even at 93. And it brings me incredible peace to know that she's living well now after caring for so many of us. Um, so two grandparents, both made of very strong stock, both loved by their family dearly, what made the difference? Her caregiver, Mrs. Sun. Mrs. Sun is the home care worker who looks after my grandmother. Every day, Mrs. Sun and another woman, Mrs. Lee, come and assist my grandmother with the things that have become a little bit more difficult over time as she's become more frail. Things like lifting, cleaning, shopping, cooking. Um, and each day, there are more things that she needs assistance with. They make sure that my grandmother gets safely to church on time and to all of her appointments. They're also immigrants from China and have become a really key part of my family's care team. My uncles and my mom do a lot for my grandmother, but none of us can imagine what we would do without them. So like so many families with aging relatives, we didn't actually have a plan for how we would care. That lack of a plan proved pretty devastating in the case of my grandfather. And in the case of my grandmother, we were just very fortunate to find Mrs. Sun and Mrs. Lee. We got lucky. 
And having them has changed everything, most importantly, my grandmother's quality of life. What's become clear to me after all of this has unfolded is that we as a country don't have a plan either. And that my story is part of a much larger story of what's happening in this country with our families. You are, you are a wonderful, joyful, loving person. You are like a father figure to me. You are just gentle. We care about each other and we take an interest in each other. Before I came to this country, I was taking care of my grandmother. So I felt that I can do the job. I took it for granted that, you know, if I wanted to do anything, I would get up, go out shopping, visiting people. Unfortunately, that's no longer the case. I noticed you were changing years ago after i been able to get you to go outside i got the opportunity then to go places with you when i got home from rehab after being away for over three months the first thing i saw were eight balloons that you had put up around my door welcoming me back and I knew I was truly home. I am totally honored uh, to be a caregiver for you. It is a great privilege and a joy for me. There are so many things that I still can't do that I depend on you to help me. And the help is given so freely and with so much love and that makes me feel a lot better and still independent. But as I said, independent with benefits. We are not only just caregivers. You are a nutritionist. You are a nurse. You are the doctor. You are my mother, Julie Davis, and you are loved by a whole lot of people. You are Dr. Morris Steiner. You are my patient. You're a pediatrician, war veteran. You have taught me things that I know would take me through the rest of my life. You are my community, but you're even more than that. You are my friends. And as much as you've done for me, there's nothing that I wouldn't do for you also. So here we are in 2017, and our families are changing. People are living longer, and we actually need more care than ever before, than we ever could have imagined when our safety net was put into place. More than 60% of, of women are actually in the workforce, so the default care support that we used to rely upon when women would stay at home, we no longer can. So at a time when we need more care, we actually have less of it. And our care workforce is working hard, like Marlene, who you just saw in the video, and earning poverty wages. The annual median income for a home care worker is $13,000 per year. 
So the workforce that we're counting on to care for us and our families can't care for their own on the income that they earn. And many of us don't realize, maybe here in the law school it's different, but that ever since the 1930s, this workforce has been excluded from some of the most basic labor protections that other workers take for granted. In the 1930s, when Congress was debating the labor laws that would be a part of the New Deal, the National Labor Relations Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, Southern members of Congress refused to support those bills if they included farm workers and domestic workers who were mostly black at the time. This racial exclusion has shaped the lives and conditions of this work now for generations. And now we are at a place where this undervalued workforce Home care in particular is the single fastest growing occupation in our entire economy. Projected to grow at five times the rate of any other workforce, home care jobs are the jobs of the future. Many are projecting that if you include child care and elder care jobs together, that by the year 2030, care jobs will be the largest workforce in our entire economy. We have got to make these jobs good jobs. We at Caring Across Generations believe this is the single most important opportunity of a generation to completely reinvent how we care for one another in this country. We have to make good care affordable and accessible to every family, and we have to make every single care job a good job. We need a care infrastructure for the future, like the grid of infrastructure that once brought us water, electricity, the internet to every home. We now need a care grid to bring great care options to every home and community in this country. Sound impossible? Well, believe it or not, the seeds are already being planted all around us. Last year, Nevada became the eighth state in the country to pass a domestic worker bill of rights at the state level, recognizing and protecting this workforce as a real profession by law. This year, Hawaii became the first state in the country to pass a bill to create a family caregiver benefit program called the Kapuna Caregiver Program. In Hawaii, as a result of this program, if you're caring for an aging parent at home, you can apply for a benefit of up to $70 per day to help you afford home modifications, respite care, or a home care aid to come and take your parent to the doctor if you need to work. In Washington, we're working on universal long-term care, and all signs point to it being passed next legislative session. In Maine, Minnesota, Michigan, and Illinois, we're laying the groundwork for a new policy idea we call universal family care. Universal family care is the idea that in the future there should be one fund that we all contribute to, that we can all benefit from, that helps us afford child care, elder care, support for people with disabilities, and paid family leave basically all of the things that we need to care for our families as we work across the lifespan. This is our moment to take caregiving, what has been a private and often isolated conversation, into the public conversation about the future of this country. And between family caregivers, professional caregivers, older adults, people with disabilities, and people living in multi-generational households, there are at least 100 million Americans who are directly affected by the need for care in America. That is a powerful force for change. At Caring Across Generations, we are building a multi-generational national movement to give voice to the 100 million of us we believe are the caring majority in this country, and we deserve the support uh, we deserve support as we struggle to care for our families in the 21st century. You may be thinking, this lady is crazy. <laughs> you wouldn't be the first one. Uh, we're still fighting off the elimination of Medicaid and the decimation of health care access, and she's talking about a whole new program to support families. 
it's true that we are living in incredibly tough times. But what I believe is that it's precisely in times like these that we need big, bold solutions, especially ones that bring us together as a country. And the risks of not doing it are incredibly great. 70% of our workforce earns less than $50,000 per year. The average cost of childcare is $24,000 per year. The average cost of a private room in a nursing home, $87,000 per year. The numbers actually just don't add up. It does not work. It is not sustainable. Families are already struggling to pay the bills and with the growing older population and the increasing need for care, pressure will grow to a breaking point if we don't do something bold. We can't afford not to. Now there's another story that's at the heart of our nation's care story. And that's the story that 40% of our direct care workforce is immigrant. 40% of our current elder care workforce is immigrant. The workforce are women like Marlene and Mrs. Lee and Mrs. Sun, and they are women who, like my family, came to this country in search of security and a better life for their families. They came for their families, and their profession is to care for ours. They are a crucial part of the most important intimate dimensions of our lives, our children our aging loved ones, our loved ones with disabilities. Their work is essentially the work of upholding the dignity of the people who cared for us and nurturing the human potential of the people that we love. And some of the most important heroic work in the economy today. And from a practical standpoint, there is in fact no way we can meet our need for care in this country without the immigrant workforce. No matter what, immigrants will have to be, and they already are, a huge part of the solution. It's an all hands on deck situation in this country, care. We are actually, and quite literally, in this together. A lot of people talk about the racial demographic change that is under, underway in this country. The fact that by 2040, we will be a majority minority or people of color nation, when you layer on top of the gener when you layer on top of the racial demographic shift, the generational demographic shift that's happening in this country, you see that the older population is much wider and the younger population is much more diverse. In some ways the state of Arizona is our canary in the mine. Arizona is the state with the most white people over the age of 65 and the most young people of color under the age of 18. So it's the most racially and generationally polarized state in the country. And it turns out that that kind of demographic <laughs> polarization is a breeding ground for resentment and division. It's not an accident that Arizona was the birthplace of the notorious legislation SB 1070, and the place where Sheriff Joe Arpaio rose to power, the notorious sheriff who made his career off of racial profiling and torturing immigrants in his detention centers. He is also known as the first and only person who's been pardoned by this administration. If we don't come together around the values and a vision for the future of this country that unites us, that makes life better for all of us. We will continue, or we run the risk, of continuing down the path that Arizona has charted for us. Care is one place where our interests truly do come together. The need for care universally affects us all, and the truth is, if we are truly to take care of all who need it in this country, it is going to take all of us immigrant, non-immigrant, family caregiver, professional caregiver, neighbors, people with disabilities, older people, all of us will have to be a part of the solution. 
My friend and civil rights leader, author Van Jones, um, talks about our country as having two truths. At our founding, we had both a founding reality and a founding dream, two truths. Our founding reality was not pretty. Uh, our nation was founded on slavery, on the occupation of lands that were once home to native nations. It was founded on the profound subordination of women, all part of our founding reality. There's no denying it, it's just the, the facts of history. We also had a founding dream that all men and women were created equal with liberty and justice for all. That is what makes us who we are. This incredibly diverse country of people from every culture, religion, place in the world, every gender, what makes us who we are is that every generation of Americans seeks to bridge the distance between the ugliness of our founding reality and the beauty of our dream. Each of us, as Americans, are actually founders in this democracy, in this narrative, that this democracy is still a work in progress. And as we go about our lives and engage with it, we are actually founding it anew. Putting care as a value and a solution at the forefront of our agenda helps keep us moving towards the beauty of the dream in this country, resisting those who would seek to pull us back to the ugliness of our founding and keeping us moving towards one another rather than turning on one another. At the White House Conference on Aging a couple of years ago, David Hyde Pierce opened, with a caregive, opened the caregiving discussion with the simple phrase, we must remember to age is to live and to care is to be human. Care connects us to our most basic and universal needs as humanity. And coming together to bring value, dignity, and worth to our caregiving relationships can and should help bring out the best in us as a nation. It can give us the kind of moral courage that we need. It can keep us grounded in that profound truth that George Saunders wants us to learn early, that in the end, we must try at all costs to avoid failures of kindness and take care of one another. Thank you. share this. Um, so thank you, Ai-jen, um, for sharing your story and for showing us how it's led to the many, the multi-pronged solutions you're approaching. And um, I, we have a few questions, and I see that a bunch of them are going to start coming in. Um, but, uh, and I've grouped some of the ones that have come, but I, I think maybe, um, and the three I have are actually about your legislative proposals. Um, so I'll see if I can, uh, I'll, uh, <laughs> but I'll put at least one of them out there. Um, so the question is, is it possible to build a labor movement that brings together employers and employees? Or should we be thinking rather on working on universal family care um, where it might be easier to find a common interest? Um, I don't think it's an either or. I actually think that universal family care has to be a part of an agenda for a labor movement and that a movement for a more caring um, economy um, has to include strong worker organizing and good jobs. Um, and so to me, these two things are so interdependent, it's hard for me to separate both from a practical standpoint in that um, the, the fact that families cannot afford 
care means that it's really impossible to imagine how the wages increase um, and there is actual benefits without a major public investment in our care uh, systems. Uh, we actually talk about care as infrastructure. If you think about the definition of infrastructure, it's that which enables commerce um, and all else in the economy to function. And um, what could be more fundamental than caring, right? The work that goes into children, caring for children, making sure that people with disabilities actually can live independently and fully be fully participating in the world. Um, so I think that um, it's hard to imagine how you get to good wages and benefits without a major investment in our care systems, like what would happen through universal family care. Um, and it's hard to imagine a constituency large enough to win either an increase in wages or universal family care without us all coming together. Um, and there's a really profound interdependence and also a, um, a way in which the movement that we need to build has to be that broad. If I now just follow up on that with my own question, um, because you have done so much work on looking at, at least in the care industry, how there might be more similarities or similar interests between employers and employees than in other areas. And so I wonder if you might just elaborate on that for a moment. Sure. Um, you know, most people who employ a domestic worker don't actually think of themselves as employers. Right, they go to work every day for somebody else, and um, because we have so culturally so devalued this work and made it so invisible, like it's just it's almost like it doesn't register that I'm an employer with employer obligations, and right, and um, and so most people, from what I can tell, are once you bring it to their attention, if they can afford it, they would strive to do right by the person, right. Now, of course, there are exceptions, and when you have something operating in the shadows of the economy, it does breed shadow behavior. Um, and so, you know, it's complicated, but I definitely feel like there has been a real um, call on the part of families to be a part of the workers' movement and, um, and a way in which the workers are also families in need of care. <laughs> You know, I mean, we have so many members of the National Domestic Workers Alliance who are in their 60s and 70s and 80s, and really they need support and services, and they don't have access to them. And so in some ways we're talking about the same people and the same needs, and it should be, um, we just need to reinvent our care economy to support that, I think. seeing here are, are, are asking you to draw on your practical experience as an organizer um, because we have I, I think we're, we're sold on the big bold vision but we're also in Texas uh, and um, that and when one looks at the, uh, the the states in which there have been successes um, they've tended not to be red states and so with that in mind uh, and with you know with, with the, the the horrors of Arizona in you know as as the canary in the coal mine, um, what, one question here is: Look, how is caring across generations balancing being realistic and pragmatic when moving policy uh, forward with the the big bold vision? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, so I'll tell you a story. The the in the state of Michigan, the one state house seat that flipped from red to blue in November of last year um, was a young candidate uh, named Darren Camilleri, 25 years old. And he heard about this idea of universal family care from our state partners in the state of Michigan, a group called Michigan United. And he decided that he was gonna make universal family care his leading issue um, in his campaign. And so he got on the doors and he talked to people in his district about their experiences and their needs when it comes to care. And he ended up winning that election by 300 votes in a district that Trump won by 6,000 votes, Tea Party District. And I think I say that to say that um, 
There is no substitute for good organizing. And, um, and there aren't any shortcuts, but when you trust the people, um, you will find that, um, that there is an appetite for bold solutions. And so I know that there's a lot of barriers in between where the people are and actually enacting policy, but I think that it requires us um, to engage and to organize. And when we do that, it's really amazing what opens up in terms of the realm of the possible. Um, and so, um, so I feel inspired by Darren, and he's got a bunch of other uh, legislat legislators in the Michigan State House, which is very conservative right now, um, who are championing universal family care. And I do think that sooner or later, we will get there. Um, and similar initiatives are happening in 12 other states and half of them are red states. One other thing, I think that the people of this country no longer have the patience for in technocratic incremental solutions. That it is so painful out there. This economy is so brutal and the divisions and um, the criminalization and the, uh, the so many things that are happening, it's just so brutal. And you can't, it's, you can't go to people and say, we're gonna tweak this thing around the edges and have it be enough anymore. If we want people to engage in this democracy, I think we have to bring them big, bold ideas. Um, I also had a few, what can we do in Texas questions, um, but uh, so maybe we can just, continue to add that to this question, which is, what would you like to see the younger generation do to help support the need for care? I have a lot of hope um, in the younger generation. What I've been um, seeing through our research is that millennials are more connected to their grandparents than any other generation in history um, because their grandparents are around longer um, because many of them are starting to live intergenerationally for economic reasons, um, because of social media and technology enabling people to stay more connected. And so um, between the boomers, who, is, who are the generation that brought us social justice and rock and roll, <laughs> like if anyone can change culture, right? Between the boomers and the millennials, we call boomers and millennials the new power couple because if they together decided to do something, it would actually happen. Um, and so, you know, all these big problems that we think are, you know, un, you know, impossible, I actually think that power couple could make it happen. And the millennials are already on this question of care. Young millennial men are way more involved in childcare than past generations of men. Um, and there are more men in professions like skilled nursing than ever before. Um, so I do think it's interesting. It would be interesting to see like, if these jobs actually became good jobs, if more men started doing them, um, especially millennial men. I don't know. I think there's a lot of gender norm bending happening in the world. And, um, and I think that uh, I have a lot of hope in the role that millennials will play in catalyzing real culture and norm change in this country. Um, and in the state of Texas, you know, one of the things that we did in New York, and Eric was part of this, is that there were always a ton of young people, students who were involved in our organizing as interns, as volunteers, doing everything from direct outreach, right, and talking to workers and talking to community members to organizing events to, um, you know, organizing to have the workers come and speak to their classes. And I think immersion in social movements and in campaigns for social justice is so, so important right now, right? We just need more people to know how to organize. And there is a growing movement of domestic workers in Texas that I think could really benefit from a lot of young people getting involved and volunteering. So. Um, and, and they're going to be at the reception, so I hope you'll connect with them to talk with them more about that. Um, so, like in farm work, um, there's been very little impetus to address the, uh, the, the, the sort of legal gray area of immigrants 
uh, making the, the, the profits of, of the industry uh, high, right? That, that, that part of the reason that farm work and care work gets to be so cheap is because the workers themselves are in a uh, can sometimes be in a legal gray zone when it comes to immigration. Um, so the, the question here is, with the push by the president to cut off uh, the flow of immigrants into the US, how will it impact the caretaking industry in the US? And can we convince our senators and representatives not to support the president? took an unexpected turn. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, we should absolutely. The last part. <laughs> um, look, I think that most people who um, are in government should know that what we're facing right now is an existential threat um, to our democracy itself. And that what's at risk is the very moral fabric and foundation of um, what uh, enables democracy in this country. And I think that um, we should be challenging our elected leaders to uh, do everything, um, everything that is necessary to defend our democracy right now. Um, nothing less is acceptable, should be acceptable. Um, and we have a very important election year next year, and there's absolutely no excuse for each and every person in this room to be engaging with voters um, and encouraging voters to engage. Um, so there's a lot that we can do there. Uh, when it comes to the question of immigration and care, this has always been um, a real challenge for us. Um, domestic work is the workforce with the highest concentration of undocumented immigrants of any sector in the economy. And, um, and it's always been a real puzzle to try to figure out how you lift standards when such a huge percentage of this workforce can be um, threatened with deportation or detention if they assert their rights and dignity. And, um, and so we have um, basically said we need to organize and that, um, that labor laws are still important platforms through which to organize and to start to change culture and norms around the treatment of this workforce. And it's interesting in New York when we passed our Domestic Worker Bill of Rights, New York went from number nine to number two in tax and labor law compliance because of the media coverage of the Bill of Rights campaign and employers suddenly realizing, oh, they're employers and they have legal obligations. And what we've sought to do in addition to that is make sure that we're organizing undocumented workers, that undocumented workers also understand that they have rights and to also continue to um, try to figure out specific strategies such that this workforce doesn't get pushed further underground in the, as we elevate standards. Um, and you know that is a constant challenge as long as our, uh, our immigration laws are what they are. And so one idea that we've been developing is creating a caregiver path to legal status and citizenship through training. Um, so we, of course, are fighting for citizenship for all, the whole 11 million undocumented. In the interim, we um, are developing a, a framework for caregivers and domestic workers to be able to get trained and legalized and be a part of the caregiving workforce through training. Um, that way, to help open up more space and conversation for, um, for a longer term fight around citizenship. there are probably three people listening to Richard Spence um, talking about white supremacy. Um, but the fact is that that's a conversation that's happening in, in the United States, and this is the moment to be organizing um, against that. And I, I'm wondering uh, the extent to which you see or the, the, that your work intersects with anti-racist work um, and, and sometimes anti-fascist work. Uh, absolutely, it's at the core of what we do. Um, our two big campaigns involve um, organizing around immigrant rights and also organizing black domestic workers 
to build the voice and capacity of black women to lead and be a part of our movement and shaping our agenda. Um, and both campaigns are interacting in a way that is about challenging white supremacy and um, talking about the legacy of slavery that has shaped domestic work and not being afraid to talk about and face that history and talking about its legacy as impacting immigrant, white, all domestic workers today. Um, our, our workforce is multiracial and um, the second we talk about that history, um, white home care workers in Wisconsin, it's just a very different lens on which to understand this country's history because it then also becomes so clear how it's shaped everyone's lives, right? Um, so we definitely see our work as um, a part of a movement to <coughs> defeat white supremacy in this country. Um, and um, I was just with uh, Brian Stevenson, who uh, many of you probably know since I'm in a law school. Um, and he's coming here. Oh, well, don't miss that. Um, it'll, it'll help you survive at least a, a couple weeks. Um, <laughs> he's building a museum uh, in Alabama um, to honor um, victims of lynching in America. And it's, a, it's an anchor uh, for us to face this history, that founding reality um, piece of who we are so that we can move forward. Um, and, you know, he often talks about how um, you know, he, there's a lot of people who approach him about doing truth and reconciliation, about race in America, but we've not actually talked about the truth. Um, and so we can't, it's, a, it's, it's actually sequential. <laughs> we have to talk about the truth in order to get to the reconciliation. And we think domestic workers can play a really helpful role in helping to tell the story of the truth. And I was with Brian yesterday in New Orleans, and we were at the Whitney Museum, which is a, on a plantation um, where thousands of people were enslaved uh, in Louisiana. And the man who, the professor from Africa who kind of framed the visit said, the truth is like fire. You can sit on it, but not forever. Um, and this truth of our founding reality, and particularly our legacy of slavery in this country is one that we, and white supremacy and its impact is one that we have to face and face it in a way that allows us to move forward together. I'm gonna try to put together a couple of questions here um, that sort of pull on different, that they get to the issue of basically affordability but also economic system generally. Um, so, um, one starts universal care is quite a distance away, so until then, what do we do? Um, but another, how can we make care more affordable but also ensure caretaking um, is caretakers earn good wages, um, which could be a sort of until then, right? Um, but then there's one that says, the solutions you discuss seem addressed to the present economic system, which those questions themselves are in some ways. Um, so how might the coming care crisis foster systematic change? And I don't know if the change is meant to be bolded, but it looks like it's sort of bolded. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that the, um, the care crisis is one of these um, unifying experiences that um, people across race and geography and generation are experiencing in one form or another. And, um, and so, and the economic pain points are so sharp. I mean, people want, run out of money so quickly. A lot of people think that Medicare covers elder care and long-term care, and it really does not. Um, the only support that people can get um, for long-term care is either if they purchase a private long-term care insurance product, which is very, very expensive, and um, very few people can do that, and oftentimes it doesn't cover what you need it, even when you've spent a lot of money for it. Um, or you can spend down and completely deplete your assets and get on Medicaid, 
And in a lot of states, the only option then is to go into a nursing home like my grandfather did. A lot of states have not yet um, rebalanced to support home-based care in the Medicaid system. And then you also have this thing where if everybody's spending down to be able to afford the care they need, it totally exacerbates an already brutally unequal economy. It's a driver of inequality. So I think that there are so many arguments. Um, we are now one of the few uh, countries in the global north where women's workforce participation is actually declining because of the care crisis. And so if we actually are serious about achieving gender equality, we're gonna have to address this issue. Um, so there's so many arguments for it. There's productivity arguments for the 54 million family caregivers who are spending 20 or more hours a week.